my material out. Um, I wanted to start today by first talking about uh, the website that I created with a colleague and uh, friend of mine about four years ago, right around the time, sort of close to the time that my father died. And uh, she had a World War II father, too, who uh, came ashore D-Day plus one. And we started talking about the impact that having a World War II father had on us as daughters and, you know, and, as women, and how little we really knew about our father's war. And we decided that there's probably a lot of baby boomers who have a lot of questions, wanted to know more. So we created a website, and the um, goal of our project was to find our father's stories. Um, and to have other World War II children share their stories, what they knew about their father. And um, what they knew about their father's war, what they knew about what they, their fathers brought home from the war. Because a lot of uh, World War II veterans brought a lot of trauma home, but it was never talked about in that generation. So um, we just thought it would be really useful. Um, we have a, number of stories posted up there, but I've had, we've had uh, hundreds and hundreds of emails from, from children of World War II veterans um, thanking us for having a place to sort of share the stories, both the positive and, and the not so positive <coughs> stories of, of, of what their dads went through. We've also had, had people who have emailed us, a few women that I've met with, um, and I've learned a lot of things. I, I didn't realize that so many children were left fatherless during the war. I've met a few different women whose fathers were killed during the war. There were 183,000 children left fatherless during World War II. I've also been contacted from um, a woman in England uh, asking how she could find out about her father, who was a World War II veteran who had been stationed in England. And she didn't know until she was 10 that her father had been, uh, you know, in the war in England. He was American. And there's a whole group over there uh, that are looking from England and Italy and France and the Netherlands and Belgium. There's uh, tens of thousands of, you know, adult children, uh, middle-aged children who are still searching for um, for the fathers that they, they didn't find, and I wasn't aware of that. So I've, I've learned a lot myself uh, having this, this website. Um, I also read an article the other day that said there's still 83,000 missing in action from World War II, which shocked me. Um, but they said that really so many of the, of the planes that went down um, the remains weren't found. Um, and I, I know some of the women that I talked to, their father's remains were never found. Um, a, his, a history professor at Penn has just written a, uh, a book called Soldier from the War Returning, uh, the, the Troubled Homecoming of the Greatest Generation. And the way he got started was that his uncle's uh, plane was the last bomber shot down over Germany. Uh, Germany surrendered, and they didn't find uh, the remains of that plane until he was he was in his 20s and his grandmother died. And he found all the letters that had been written uh, to his grandmother by the uh, other families of the crew that died, and he spoke German. And he went over and he helped to find where the remains of the plane, uh, where the remains of his uncle and some of the other crew members were because he could speak German, he was able to go to the village and um, talk to the men who were boys who saw the plane go down. So there's a lot that I've learned uh, that was sort of surprising to me because we think of World War II in terms of uh, Tom Brokaw and the greatest generation, and that's all true, but we don't know the other side of it too, and a lot of the, uh, a lot of the sadness. And as, as a child of World War II, I, I just think there's positives and there were, there were sadnesses uh, without War II, not just, you know, subsequent wars. And, and that's part of the format that we have on my website and, and the blog. Um, so, uh, 
16.5 million Americans fought in World War II, and I say now, they, they estimate maybe 2.5 million World War II veterans are still alive. Um, so it's really up to the children to, to be caretakers of their father's memories. Um, sometimes what the children know is what they found out from their mothers, not from their fathers. Um, and I also wanted to note, too, that some of the movies that in the past 10 years, 15 years, uh, Saving Private Ryan, Flags of Our Fathers, Steven Spielberg's a son of a World War II veteran, and uh, Ron, uh, Ron Powers, I think, who wrote Flags of Our Fathers, his father was one of the flag raisers uh, at Iwo Jima. So you're finding, I'm finding more and more, I guess because I'm looking for it too, but I'm finding more and more uh, books, movies, so much curiosity among my generation of actually really knowing what happened because our fathers never talked about it really. And uh, it's important, the stories are important for family history uh, and also personal understanding of how war left its mark. And each story is a piece of uh, mid 20th century American history. It's, you know, it fits into the larger context of history. And if you get these stories, you start to get more of a totality of, of the war's experience. Um, I have found about 20 books or so written by children of World War II veterans, you know, about their father's war. There's over uh, 150 websites, web pages in honor or memory of World War II family members, fathers, uncles. Um, in terms of the reunions of the vets, uh, I know I belong to a group uh, which is friends and families of the 505. My father was in the uh, 505 Parachute Infantry Regiment of the 82nd Airborne, and a lot of the a lot of the soldiers are gone now, but their children and nieces and nephews are keeping uh, organizational lives. So you're finding that the children are going to to the reunions. Uh, World War II tours. Uh, 80 to 90 percent are now who go on these World War II tours, and they're doing a booming business. Are now children and grandchildren of veterans. So there is this this interest, uh, and it's it's sad that so many people sort of waited, didn't realize the stories were going to be lost, and you know they're trying. I'm, I get email after email. Can do you know anybody who might have known my father? Uh, and I'm, I'm, you know, we're not that type of organization. We're just two women. But I try to put them in touch with with other organizations that might be helpful. I even get it sometimes. I uh, got an email yesterday from a woman who said that um, she's trying to find her sister in Germany that her Vietnam era father father when he was in Germany before he went to Vietnam. Is there any way that I can help her? Why well, know there's an organization now, Daughters of Vietnam Veterans, and I'm in touch with the woman who created that organization. She's in Texas, and we're an email touch. So I'll, I'll send her there. So some way I feel like it's, it's basically like a clearinghouse to, you know, um, pardon? I'm sorry. Um, the stories are, uh, both positive and negative. Uh, you find a lot of stories about the camaraderie of war and how the veterans develop lifelong friendships. 50% uh, of World War II vets used the GI Bill for education, and 30% used VA loans to buy a home. Uh, but as I said before, some of the surprises that I've learned about fatherless children. I wanted to. Um, talk a little bit about my dad and then a little bit about my stepdad. Um, my father was an 82nd Airborne Paratrooper and he was portrayed in The Longest Day, the movie The Longest Day, uh, which probably a lot of you have seen since it's been on like 10,000 times uh, over the years. But basically, um, the first, my, my, my dad, I knew he was in the Army when I was a kid uh, because he used to have us do marching games. You know, you'd have to march uh, around the house. My sister and I went all around the house. We were really little. And he does march, then he'd have a standard attention and at ease. So, I mean, you know, I sort of got the impression that his war was sort of fun. He never talked about it. I never saw any of his medals or anything. Uh, he always wore this ring, uh, his 82nd Airborne Paratrooper ring, which, which he, 
he gave to me you know, in the later years of his life. But that's about all I know. I thought it was fun. So uh, he and my mom divorced in about 1958. I was about 12 or, or so. And my cousin's here. My uncle had kept this Reader's Digest uh, condensed edition of The Longest Day, which has an excerpt in there, which was really the first time I sort of read about uh, about my dad in World War II. Um, I'd like you to, to read the, the excerpt of how it described what his experience was like the night before D-Day. It was about 10 p.m. when Private Arthur Dutch Schultz of the 82nd Airborne Division decided to get out of the crap game. He might never have this much money again. The game had been going on ever since the announcement that the airborne assault was off for at least 24 hours. It had begun behind a tent, next to moved under the wing of a plane, and now the session was going full blast in the hangar. Dutch was one of the big winners. How much he won, he didn't know. But he guessed it came to more than $2,500, more money than he'd seen at any one time in almost 21 years. Physically and spiritually, he had done everything to prepare himself for the jump. In the morning, several services for all denominations had been held on the airfield, and Dutch, a Catholic, had gone to confession and received communion. Now he knew exactly what he was going to do with his winnings. He mentally figured out the distribution. He would leave $1,000 with the ad adjunct's office. He would use that on a pass when he got back to England. Another thousand he planned to send to his mother in Philadelphia, which was an actor. His mother was in California. It was My mother was in Philadelphia, but he wasn't married to her yet. He had a special purpose for the remainder. That would go to a, what a hell of a hell of a blowout with his outfit, the 505 reach Paris. Young paratrooper felt good. He felt he had taken care of everything. But had he, why did an incident which had occurred that morning keep coming back, filling him with so much uneasiness? At mail call that morning, he received a letter from his mother and closed with it was a rosary. Now the thought of a rosary suddenly gave rise to a question that hadn't struck him before. What was he doing gambling at a time like this? He looked at the folded and crumpled bills. At that moment, he knew that if he pocketed all this money, he surely would be killed. Dutch decided to take no chances. Move over, he said, and let me get at the play. He glanced at his watch and wondered how long it would take to lose $2,500. Which he then proceeded to do. So, you know, there were other scenes. I, I remember being uh, when the, the book was made into a movie in 1962. I remember being at the premiere in Philadelphia, and they had him up on stage, and they, I think they had Omar Bradley was there, and it was sort of you know a, a, a big deal. But still, if you've seen the longest day, here's my dad losing money in a crap game, and then he sort of gets lost. He's, he was played by Richard Famer in the movie, so he sort of gets lost. Um, and then at the end, he's in the final scene of the movie uh, with Richard Burton, and Richard Burton says, there's a German there, and he says, he's dead, I'm injured, and you're lost. And, and then my dad's like, oh, well, the war, who won the war or something? So this black and white image was, was in my head. It's like, well, his war wasn't so bad. I mean, you know, why is he really, you know, that he had some problems with alcoholism, which he eventually beat, but like, why is he having problems? His war wasn't really that bad. I didn't know the reality of it, because it was sort of that, that mythic image. And I found out later, sort of much later in life, that uh, that $2,500 that he supposedly lost because uh, he thought he was, he was going to die, well, this is what he told me. And he also told an author uh, who wrote First Men In, Edward Shiro, he wrote First Men In, The Men Who Saved D-Day. He told him that too, so it's in a footnote to that book. He had won $2,500 and had succeeded in overpowering every soldier in the game except for a sergeant he disliked intensely. My father had told me in his story, Edward Shiro, that when he sold the sergeant and only got 40 or $50 left, he decided to take the rest of the man's money and complete his humiliation. But his love turned, and he lost all of his previous winnings trying to break the sergeant. So basically, his motives weren't so high and mighty. He was sort of trying to break a guy that he didn't like. So that was just just one of the uh, one of the sort of fictions that I grew up with. And it wasn't until the '90s when I saw Saving Private Ryan, and I, I sort I think visually 
uh, that movie opened the eyes of a lot of baby boomers to actually, I mean, I know it wasn't war itself, but it was a pretty realistic depiction of war. And I think it sort of shocked a lot of us into like, hey, this was pretty horrendous. Uh, so I started, you know, I said, you know, Dad, you've been in so many books because he was in three of Ryan's books. He was, uh, he was in three of Stephen Ambrose's books. So he was in a number of documentaries. And it was like, you know, all these, like, historians were asking him about the war, but I had never really talked to him about the war. So I started asking him some questions, and uh, he started telling me a little bit more about, like, what it was really like. Uh, when, uh, when he was jumping on D-Day, the, the plane, his plane was taking a lot of flack, and uh, they weren't at the, the right altitude. It wasn't at the right altitude, so his plane was up and down, up and down. It, they were supposed to be jumping at uh, 600 feet. They jumped at 250 feet. So when he jumped, he, he wrenched his back pretty bad. Uh, then he, he was sort of lost. I mean, he, he was spending the, uh, he, he was wandering around the hedgerows. And uh, he heard a sound, and then he had an M1. He pointed it to the sound, and he pulled a trigger, and realized that he forgot to load his M1. <laughs> you know, he was, he was all prepared. He had the 150 pounds or whatever in his back, but he didn't load his rifle. So uh, luckily, it was only a cow. But <laughs> um, he, I never realized that the, the battle for St. Mary Lee's, which was the battle uh, that the uh, the 505 uh, was supposed to be jumped right near there. Some of the, if, if you've seen the movie, you know, so many of the paratroopers were jumped right in the center of town, and there was a fire, and a lot of them, you know, died. Uh, and that famous scene was John Steele on, on top of the church there, and they still have a power trooper image there. Uh, he was lucky he wasn't dropped in, in the town because so many of those guys were killed. He was lucky he wasn't dropped in, in the swamp. You know, so he was luckier than most, even though he was wandering around for four or five hours. He finally was found by the commander of the 505 at that time, it was, it was James Gavin. And uh, Gavin gathered between 100 and 150 troopers and brought them to St. Mary Lee's to the Lafayette Bridge. I never knew that my dad actually fought in that battle because I thought, well, he missed the battle on the first day. I didn't realize the battle went on for four days. Um, and it was, it was pretty bloody. I mean, you know, the, uh, the pole was, was pretty horrendous. And, uh, he was right in the middle of that. So that was sort of the, the first uh, awakening that I had about, about, about D-Day. Uh, there was something here. He's in this book, too. This is a book. It's a, uh, The Combat History of the 505 in World War II. Here's my dad's uh, being quoted on June 7th, which was you know, the day after D-Day. By the late afternoon of June 7th, Private Arthur Dutch Schultz with Company C at the Lafayette Bridge had endured almost constant German shelling all day. I was walking to the rear for some reason when I crossed paths with Lieutenant Colonel Mark Alexander. When a young trooper approached us and said he had been hit, both of us looked and couldn't see anything until he turned his back, exposing a gaping shrapnel wound. I was partially mobilized while the colonel called for a medic and started telling the scared kid that he was going to be all right while gently letting him sit down on the ground. What was so incongruous to me at that moment was the fact that this wounded trooper was able to walk and the other was that this battle commander showed so much tender care in the middle of all this death and destruction that was everywhere. So I started to get, I guess toward the end of my father's life, I started to get a, a much better sense of, you know, the reality of, of what he had experienced. Uh, after St. Eric Lee's, he, I think he lasted maybe, uh, yeah, he, he lasted until June 14th. He, he couldn't walk after June 14th because of the back injury that he got, and he was sort of immobile. But after, after that, uh, he was taken out for about a week. He was hospitalized in England for about a week. Then he rejoined the division. Uh, and they fought for 33 state, 
straight date. <coughs> um, and uh, basically, one of the books at least says the elite status of the paratroopers grew to legendary proportions after Normandy. Its record in Normandy may well have been the most remarkable of any division in army history, and though poorly dropped and instantly surrounded and threatened with annihilation, squeezed into the small St. Mary Lee's Triangle. It had held a determined and far larger enemy at bay for 36 desperate hours without tanks and little or no artillery with very little ammunition. And if they hadn't been successful there, then the Americans couldn't have gotten off of uh, Utah Beach. So it was, it was instrumental in the success of D-Day. Market Garden, I really knew nothing about. I mean, the name of it, I, I knew that uh, he was mentioned in a book called by Cornelius Ryan called A Bridge Too Far. And I knew it was Market Garden, but it, it sounded like a pleasant like afternoon picnic, you know, a farmer's market. Uh, market Garden was ended up being sort of a, a disaster, which is what Bridge Too Far says. Uh, 20,000 paratroopers, American and British, were dropped into the ne Netherlands on September 17, 1944, with the objective of taking and holding the bridge is in or near Eindhoven. I think that was the 101 near Eindhoven and the 82nd near Nijmegen. They had heavy, heavy casualties. The British troops at Arnheim, which was the bridge too far, on the Rhine River border of Germany were pinned down by the Germans and had to surrender on September 25th, 1944. They thought that that was going to bring the early end of the war, but it failed. 16,000 Britons and Americans and Poles had been lost. More casualties than the Allies had suffered all the land and beaches on D-Day. Uh, that said that Mark of Garden was a soft landing. He said that was the softest landing that he had, he had ever had. He also told me that he was always scared to death when he jumped. He said some of the guys just really loved to jump. He said he was always scared to death. And for his first practice jump, he passed out. He didn't remember anything until he hit the ground. But he said he was always afraid. Uh, but, you know, he jumped anyhow. But, uh, the, I, think, I think Market Garden sort of added of the, the emotional poll my dad because his uh, the leader of his of C company uh, the 505 my dad absolutely adored he was uh, named Captain Anthony Steph Stefanich and he had gathered my father and other troopers to help soldiers who were in a glider to crash in the drop zone and to draw an enemy fire uh, Captain Steph got hit in the upper torso by rifle fire which set his fire smoke grenade he was carrying. He died within within minutes of my father standing over him saying, Hail Mary's. When Captain Steph died, my father told Stephen Ambrose that he broke down and cried the only time in combat my father ever went. So I think that, that battle took a more of an emotional toll because I hardly even knew about the battle. Um, I didn't know I I reread a bridge too far, you know, about, I guess it was early 2001, and I said, Dad, I didn't know you were a barman, which I should know is B-A-R for friend. Well, he said I might have been a barman, but that's not how you say it. I didn't know that he was a Browning automatic rifleman. And I said, like, you never told me that. And he said, well, I didn't think it was important. And I said, well, I read the life expectancy of a B-A-R team member in World War II in about 11 seconds. <laughs> we were <at> three, <laughs> three minutes. And I said, well, "Why were you that?" He said, "Well, no one else wanted to do it, so I volunteered." You know, okay. But I mean, I was sort of finding stuff out really late in his life and asking him questions because he just never told me. So if I didn't ask him the questions, if I didn't go to these books and start reading about what he told other people, I wouldn't have known too much. Uh, the 82nd Airborne was in continuous combat around Nijmegen for 56 days until they were relieved by Canadian soldiers on November 11. By the end of Market Garden, my father was pretty, uh, pretty battle-hardened, and he learned to suppress sort of his emotional response to the death and, and destruction. They didn't have as much rest as they thought they were going to because uh, the Battle of the Bulge occurred. And uh, they were in, uh, you say, Reims, France? Reims, France? 
aftermarket garden, and the uh, the counter defensive against the Allied troops was being planned for uh, December 16, 1944. Hitler attacked along a thinly defended Siegfried line. The 82nd was called back to action and arrived in World Vermont, in Belgium, on December 18, 1944. Uh, my dad was there for part of the time. However, he got pneumonia and dysentery, and he was pulled uh, offline into the hospital on Christmas, and he was out of action from Christmas until January 8, 1945. When he returned to C Company, he came back to a unit that was virtually wiped out. He later said if he could have cried, he would have gotten some of the pain and guilt out. Upon his return, he realized the company he came to know and love no longer existed. The 505 <coughs> Regiment, of which Company C was a part, was down to under 50% strength. So, uh, uh, the Bulge, uh, he lost a lot of good friends in the Bulge. Once again, I didn't know until, until uh, very late in his life. Uh, in uh, mid-January, the Belgian town of P-A-T-U-S, so, however you say P-A-T-U-S, uh, put the paratroopers up in, in their homes so that they could actually, uh, you know, take a bath and get a meal because, and he also told me, this was interesting, he told me that he didn't have a winter coat, that they, they were pulled back to uh, the line so quickly that the supplies had not come in for the winter because they they had expected market garden and sort of, and you know, the war, but they certainly didn't expect the bulge. And my dad didn't have a winter coat to go out, you know, fighting in, in December. And he said what he did was he cut a uh, sleeping bag. He had long johns and jackets and stuff, and cut a sleeping bag and put it over his head and wore that as a coat and also slept in it at night. And the idea of like digging foxholes, you know, 10 degree weather, and trying to sleep in foxholes in 10 degree weather is, was like amazing to me. It's like, we never talked about this. And it was funny because uh, uh, one of the women who, uh, who gave me her story about her dad, who was also a paratrooper, <coughs> she would say when they were kids and they were complaining about the bedrooms too, being too cold, he would say, what are you complaining about? It'll never be as cold as the bulge. So uh, basically, you know, these things sort of harken back to I guess the father is. He he was in the the, the family house for about uh, about two weeks, and he got very close with the family. Uh, at the end of January, the eighty second was back in battle, and in early February arrived at a place my father said resembled Dante's Inferno. It was the Hurricane Forest where catastrophic losses had befallen the American army in November of nineteen forty four. When Dad and his division came through the scene. And he wrote a little essay on this, which is how I found out about Hurricane Forest. The snow was slowly melting, and the bloody Hurricane was giving up his dead. Sprawled in the maze of trees were the corpses of hundreds of American soldiers, grotesque and rigid, just emerging from the deep snow under which they had been preserved all winter. The flesh of the bodies had rotted and were peeling from the skeleton. The majority of the dead were from the 88, 28th Infantry. National Guard, the unit that decimated the previous November. All told, the capture toll from the Hurricane was 24,000 dead, wounded, captured, or missing. This all occurred in a battle that was a fiasco and passed unnoticed. It wasn't unnoticed by my father. He said he never witnessed such carnage. The odor was so overpowering that in an exhausted state, he passed out and laid on the side of the road, not caring whether he lived or died. A lieutenant pulled him a mile to an aid station, saving his life. He had pneumonia again and surely would have died from exposure in the cold forest. I thought and harkened back to this incident in 2005 death, <laughs> saying that he hadn't felt so bad since the bulge and Herpkin. I remember him saying, about a week before he died, he said to me, I haven't felt this bad since the bulge. And that was like 61 years before he died, and you know, he went right back there. Um, he continued through the remainder of the war. He crossed the Elbe River into Germany near Cologne, shortly before the Germans surrender on May 7, 1944. And he remained with his division in Germany until December 1944, when he returned to the United States. 
Um, well, I didn't know too, and I've read some of the material that said, well, the World War II guys had it easier because they all went over together and they all came back together. That wasn't true. There was a, my dad was a replacement. He was not in, uh, he didn't jump in Sicily and Salerno. His first jump was D-Day. So he was replacing soldiers who died in those battles. So, and he said that replacements, no one wanted to get too close to them because they didn't know how long they would survive. They were new. So it wasn't like, you know, you had this unit that stayed together all the time. Uh, so that was sort of like a myth that I thought, well, they all went over, they all came back. Not true. Uh, they were plugged into different places. They, and one of his friends is still alive. Uh, he's 89 years old, one of his paratrooper friends. And he said they called them repo depo. Um, but, uh, you know, you would get plugged in. You, you weren't with a, a, maybe if you started out, you know, in 1942 with an original group of guys and you survived, you were with people you knew, but you would get plugged in. Also, coming home, uh, they used a point system where you got points for how many battles, how long you've been in, how many medals. So people didn't all come home together. It wasn't one, one big uh, regiment coming home on the ship together. You were coming home separately. He came home in December. His friends came home. Some of his friends, his friend that I'm still in touch with, came home in uh, late January. So they didn't all come home together. Uh, so basically, uh, that was that was my father's war, and I just have gotten a lot of information uh, more about this war, and I'm finding that more and more children are doing the same. Uh, I also have, have a stepdad who uh, was uh, from uh, Minnesota and also from uh, Rance in Montana. And his, his story is a little different. He was a little younger. Um, my father was born in 23 and my stepdad, Lee, was born in 25. He wasn't in the war as long and he also said, you know, not being in combat, he didn't have the same impact or the traumas that my father did. He, uh, he was an electronic radar technician in the Pacific. He was on the uh, USS Cleveland, um, and he was the sole technician in charge of the maintenance and repair of the ship's new radar installations. Uh, he said that that was like the most modern search and fire control radars, which provided interception of enemy targets. Um, and he had to keep the radar system maintained and operational on a 24-7 basis, which seems to me like a pretty stressful job, but he, he handled it pretty well. But uh, he joined the, the Cleveland, the Pacific Theater, in January 45, prior to the campaign to recapture the Philippines. And then he was involved, uh, Cleveland was involved in the bombardment of Corregidor, and witnessed paratroopers landing on Corregidor. And uh, he also went to Subic Bay in British North Borneo. On June 25th of 45, he, they were dispatched to Manila to pick up Douglas MacArthur. And they were selected because of their advanced radar system. So he, he, he said that was pretty exciting. Uh, their next campaign after they returned MacArthur to Manila was Okinawa. And he said that this was, uh, this was sort of the scarier part. This was massive kamikaze attacks. and. Uh, a lot of ships around them, as a matter of fact, the ship right next to him was, was, was struck, but they weren't struck. Uh, and uh, he said that they, when they received word on August 10th that a, two atomic bombs had been dropped in uh, Japan, had agreed to surrender, they celebrated, but then there were some more suicide pilots who came and were attacking the ship, even after a supposed surrender. But he, uh, he, he went into uh, Occupy Japan. He didn't have the same kind of sort of war trauma as, as, my, uh, as my father did. Um, there's millions more stories. There were so many people who were um, in World War II that it's, it's woven through you know, our society. And there's so many more stories. And there's uh, a need, I think, for, for children if they have, and grandchildren if they have the opportunity now to to ask or for uh, fathers and, and grandfathers to tell the story so they don't get lost. And uh, I'll take questions now if anybody has any. Uh -huh. Did your father uh, say how long he was uh, in the uh, Foxhall at 
by the revolt. How long? How long he was there? Uh, well, he, he. I'm trying to think. He was he was taken out on the 25th, came back on the 8th, then went to the Herkin through February, March. I, I mean, I don't think they. End of January. Yeah. Probably end of January then. And, but then they went to a hurricane in February. Yeah. So they were back out pretty quickly. Pretty quickly. And he said that uh, basically he was he was really, you know, sick. I mean he you know, he was really dragging and that's why I guess uh, that march to the hurricane is why he collapsed and he said that the, the lieutenant who, who drug him saved him, and their hats got mixed up. And he said when he was in the aid station, people kept saluting him. And he was a private, and he kept saying, why are they saluting me? But he said, you know, at that point, I didn't care if I left or died. I mean, he had double pneumonia and everything, you know. So uh, he was out for a while again, and, and then was back when they were, uh, I guess, back within about two weeks after that. Did he indicate how much equipment he lost when he jumped? He didn't lose too much. Unlike a lot of the other guys, he didn't lose too much. He, uh, the main thing he talked about was wrenching his back and how he uh, he fought with the VA or appealed VA decisions for years because they said that his, his back problems were not uh, combat related, and he had kept his he kept the documents, you know, at the field hospital. He had copies of all that that said, you know, wrenched back. And they took him off on, on the 14th, and it wasn't until about 1998 that he got his full benefits for 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 disability. He got, I think, about a 20% uh, PTSD rating in the 60s. After he he really had a, had a tough time. There's a, a little piece of where are they now? Uh, Reader's Digest in 1994 had a, a 50th anniversary of D-Day edition, and they reprinted the. Did I read this yet? I don't think I did. The excerpt from The Longest Day, and it said, what, like, what happened to them? Paratrooper Doug Schultz's war went from hot to cold to one within. After seeing combat in Holland, at the Battle of the Bulge, and later in Germany, he became an Army counterintelligence agent working undercover in post-war Europe. The fact that he had survived a war that had claimed so many good men proved too burdensome for Schultz and declined to near ruin as an alcoholic. He stopped drinking, earned several college degrees, and ultimately became a uh, drug and alcohol director for private programs and then for the Army. So. Your dad's moniker was Doug Schultz, right? Right. Was he related to the famous Doug Schultz? No. Uh, no. Uh, Fliegenheimer, right? <laughs> well, yeah. yeah, it wasn't that his name, but that it was. No, I guess they nicknamed a lot of them Dutch back then. Yeah. Beer power. Yeah, no, he wasn't related. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Richard Burke. Yeah. And he would get he would get letters from uh, young people, like in the eighties and nineties, from France and Belgium and Netherlands, just writing to them because they so they read about him in a book. For, and he would have like you know sort of these uh, pen pal relationships with these young people uh, who were still, you know, over in Europe, just like um, so grateful, I guess, to what the American Army did. And uh, that, that always made him feel pretty good. And I think he felt like he lost a lot because of the war, but then he gained a lot too. I mean, you know, he basically lost his career and ended up, you know, with three marriages and, and things being sort of tough. But he said he gained a lot, of, he got, gained a lot of leadership skills, and he sort of gained, and it was interesting, his, his paratrooper friend said to me a few months ago, he said, you know, it was a tragedy, but it was also a salvation. Because a lot of the strength that he got from going through the war and going through the military training, helped him pull himself out too. So, you know, there's positives and negatives. And I think, you know, I think the stories of World War II are complex. They're not just uh, as, as uh, you know, free of uh, the tragedy. As, as, and I think when you were reading the poem by Sassoon and you're talking about suicide of, you know, veterans today, they didn't really keep accurate statistics for World War II veterans. Uh, so when they say they didn't have PTSD, that's because they didn't actually have a PTSD diagnosis 
uh, until 1980, until after the Vietnam War. But my dad did try to get help for emotional problems, and I was able to get copies of his VA files. And going back into the 50s and 60s, he was trying to get help, and they were, they were saying anxiety neurosis, um, character disorder, inability to digest wartime experiences, like it was like, you know, some, some curse or something, something matter with him, instead of actually admitting that the war could actually impact these, these men. So uh, going through those VA files that I, I was able to get after he died, I was, I was able to sort of see how much he had tried to get help. And um, there's the statistics from World War II. I've tried, I've looked for studies on like the impact of World War II fathers in terms of, of their children, the impact on their children. There's one study that I was able to find that consisted of five families. Whereas the Vietnam War studies, there's a lot of studies of both the United States and Australia that talk about the impact of having a, a father with PTSD on the children and on the family. So it wasn't that it didn't exist, it was that they didn't have a name for it, they didn't recognize it as, as really a really big problem. Yeah, pretty rough. Yes. Yeah. Worse than jumping. It was because you crash and you know. 